So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm big on notes. I'll use a lot of different notes. Uh, part of the reason for that is that my grandfather, who's now 95, uh, is in the hospital. And I almost didn't make it here because he had a bit of a scare. So I spent the night at the hospital. I packed my bag hopeful that I'd be able to come. Spent the night at the hospital. And at the last second, when he was transferred back where I wanted him, I was able to leave, get in a cab. Uh, well, Uber driver was waiting for me downstairs and went to the airport. So I really want to ask a quick question. Who here almost didn't come or had a really good reason to not be here? Anybody? And what about you? Really, really good reason that we'll hear about. Anybody else? Anybody in the audience who just almost didn't come? Something come up? Or no? Well, I thought it'd be interesting to ask that question because sometimes you never know what you're going to get when you ask a question like that. But I think that in, in life, circumstances are always very, very mixed and life is constantly unfolding. And I don't believe that there are many coincidences or accidents in life. Um, I actually do believe that uh, nothing worth doing is impossible. And that belief for me comes from uh, the art of magic. So one thing that I'm very passionate about and one thing that I've done for a really long time is I'm a professional magician. And as I'll share with you, that informs a lot of the way that I think about life. And we've heard you know, magical experiences mentioned a few times, and that always makes me really happy, because I think magic is, uh, life is quite a magical experience. Now, the talk is, is honor your champion, branding from the ashes of adversity. But I had an option there. It could have also been magic or boxing, architecting assumptions beyond adversity. And the reason for that is because I knew when I was preparing to give this talk that it would be a little bit different than all the other times I've talked about the business. It wouldn't be just about what we do and, and how we did it, but it'd have to be a little bit about what animates the ideas that, that built the business. So I'd have to go back to the time before I ran a business and come forward to take some of the observations I've learned since. And so it's very layered, and I encourage you to ask any questions later, because I think it's, it's, I'm happy to see that we've got a conversation going. So a lot can unfold that way. Before I get to the crux of the talk, I want to show you some photos so that you all have a better understanding of what it is that I do. Um, if you've never seen a boxing belt close up, there's one. So Sartonk is the company that was founded in 2009 uh, to really change the way the industry saw these belts. That's a champion of the decade belt that was won by Marquez in the Pacquiao fight. I don't know if anybody watches boxing. Anybody, show of hands, anybody watch boxing in here? Cool, cool. That's a one-of-a-kind art belt that was created for an art exhibit. Um, that's what the craft looks like. So that was created before Floyd Mayweather fought Canelo. And there is Floyd holding, holding the belt, along with the Man of Triumph, which is, a, which is a sculptural trophy to the left there. Those are my grandfather's hands. He's 87 in this photo, the time of the founding of the company. And then the back of that. The front of that belt looks like the one he's holding up there, Manny. I don't want to go too fast. But. So this is one of the posters that came out um, that really spotlighted the belts in a way that had never been done before. It's my grandfather at one of our first events. It's a lot of telling the story, us working on some stuff, my grandmother painting. And this is the June issue of ESPN. And if you open this, you would have found a spread in there that looks like that. So that's my grandfather signing him and kind of seeing himself in print, which is a real awesome experience. That's Hoss Meek, our director of operations. My uh, former wife, but still very close friend and director of operations. That's my grandfather and I at his induction into the Hall of Fame. Mike Tyson's induction the following year. My grandfather welcomed him in. That is the recipient of our Ali King Award. An Ali King Award is something that we created to promote literacy with our company. So we didn't want to just build a company, but we wanted to do something socially relevant. And so promoting literacy in the boxing community was one of them. And I think we're, well, here's our Honor Champion apparel line. And that's where I want to stop with this for now. Uh, but just so you know, we won the 2014 FedEx Small Business Grant which was really fascinating because as I'll start talking about right now, I had no intention of starting a business, none. Uh, I was a philosophy major and a magician. And at the time that the business was founded in 2009, I was in Armenia. 
post-Soviet developing country doing human rights work, where I was using magic to create a curriculum with the Red Cross to talk to victims of war, children who were refugees of war, about how to reinvent their narratives and how to reimagine their lives and see a reality beyond the difficulties that they were encountering. And that program um, was very fulfilling for me and I was coming back to the United States having graduated full of all these ideas about what I was going to do and how I was gonna carve a path to bring that message to a wider audience. And when I got back, well, before I got back, I should say that, um, I should say that before I got back, we watched a recession uh, on BBC and CNN, 2009, right? Everything's collapsing in the US. Our friends uh, who have just recently graduated are telling us they can't find jobs. We haven't yet applied for jobs. And at that time, I didn't know that I'd never apply for a job in a post-recession economy. When I came back from Armenia, my grandfather, who was 87, told me for the first time, can you still hear me? Yeah? Uh, no, this is not on? Well, I'll speak here for the second. But uh, My grandfather, for the first time, told me um, that the business was suffering. Now, at this time, he had retired mostly. He was just more doing it as a hobby, craft. Uh, but he did have a business, and he did have a legacy. Oh, that's a bad time for that. Um, I'll let him know what he interrupted. Um, and essentially, what the business was doing bad meant was that there were no more orders. There were no orders, and he had no clue why. And, uh, and he had shielded me from this. He had always encouraged me to pursue my magic and to pursue my studies. And so the first time he told me something was wrong, and so I researched to find out what was going on. And what I came to discover was that, first of all, there was a huge knowledge gap. In 2009, no one knew anything about where boxing belts were made. They didn't know whether they were made here in China. They didn't know who made them. Uh, they didn't know that it was a wonderful story about somebody who came to America, and it was sort of an Americana story. But because of that knowledge gap, imitators and frauds were able to imitate his work, in fact, going as far as claiming to be him. Um, some were domestic, some were international. One in particular actually said, I am the grandson of the original creator of these belts. And that was really jarring. It was, uh, it's almost funny now, but it was really nauseating. It was perhaps one of the most nauseating moments in my life. And in school, I studied philosophy, as I mentioned, and political theory, political science, and also social justice. Now, for me, magic, I've never thought of myself as an entertainer. I've thought of myself as a magician, but never as an entertainer. And that's something that I've struggled with for the better part of my life. I've wondered what that means, right? I, I am a performance magician. I'm not alluding to anything occult. Um, but I was never really as interested with the performance as magic as much as I was interested in what magic meant to life and where magic really took place. And I began to become very convinced convinced through my experiences and my performances and my reactions with people and hearing their stories about their experience of magic, that really takes place in the mind. The same mind, incidentally, which curates our realities. And so this idea of architecting our assumptions to, to lead to success is a really, really big important point here. Now, the res this recession has happened. I've discovered that my grandfather's work is just not recognized, that his legacy is lost, and that people are benefiting from that, and they're claiming le they're his legacy is their own. It's a matter of dignity. And for me, this was a moment, a crucial moment, where I had to think about what it meant to be a student of social justice to make a choice, right? Do you back away from the insurmountable odds, or do you try to do something you, you can't imagine doing? It's overwhelming. As a magician, is something impossible, and is that simply the end of the statement? It's impossible to just build a company with no resources? See, I only had $2,000 in my name, and that was because a friend had loaned it to me to go to Armenia, so I had to give him that money back. The other part of the story is that the one person who he had, my grandfather had trusted with the accounting, because he didn't do any marketing or accounting, that person, I later found out, had been stealing money from all of his clients and also pocketing the money she was supposed to use to pay rent. And so he was evicted couldn't feed his cat, couldn't get into his shop. This is a man who's been working since he was 14 years old, who raised me, couldn't get into his shop to feed his cat. Now, with those odds, um, I think it would have been very easy for me to just turn my back and think, well, let me just continue doing what I'm doing. But in order to tell him, I had to give him an answer, right? So he asked me what's happening with the business, and I had to either tell him all of this, or I had to just give him something different. And so instead of telling him exactly what was going on, he was 87, he was having nightmares about betrayal, he was speaking in his sleep, he was really degenerating in, in, in really scary ways, the family was scared about him psychologically. 
He had mild Alzheimer's at the time, it had really been setting in, and, and it was being exacerbated by the trauma because he had heard a little bit of what was going on. He, he at least had a sense that he was evicted and there was a reason for that. So I decided with my then wife, Hasnik, to found a company. And instead of telling him what had happened, to tell him that we're gonna do something, we're gonna build something. And so we needed a name, and so we looked at our Armenian roots, and the word Zartonk in Armenian means renaissance, rebirth, and we replaced the S, the Z with an S, for Sahagyan, his name. And thus was born the company called Sartonk, which means renaissance and rebirth. Now, again, I, I wasn't into business. And so for me, that was very daunting. The first thing I did was to go to the bookstore, and I, I had to make another choice, right? Now the choice was between idiots or dummies. The dummies guide, or the idiots, the idiots guide to business, or, or business for dummies. For anyone who wonders, I chose the idiots because they give you a free CD. Um, <laughs> Now, what was interesting about this, and this really alludes to kind of the premise of my talk, is that sitting at Borders was a guy who I recognized. His name's Don Duncan. We've since become very, very close friends. Don, I recognized as a guy who interjected into a conversation I was having with friends at a restaurant near Columbia University a year prior. We were talking about civil rights and Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X and nonviolence, and Don had some really important opinions or some heavy opinions about Malcolm X and, and MLK. And so we engaged in the conversation, never saw each other again. Now I meet Don again. He's sitting at the same little round table in Borders, and he finds out what I'm up to and what I'm doing, and he's, he's a former entrepreneur, and he's in corporate America and doesn't really like it very much. At the time, he was working at a really corporate job that didn't satisfy his spirit, and he really, really begun to, to tell me that he, he likes what I do with my life, and he's really sort of interested in what I preoccupy myself with, with magic and poetry and, and meditating and things like that. And then what I saw in him was a, a good deal of insight about things that I didn't understand very well. And so I came into the boxing industry through a lot of serendipity, right? It's my grandfather's legacy. He's the original creator of all the belts that we just saw. 1975 to 1990, he developed these belts, and since then, they've adorned every champion in the world, every world champion in boxing in the world, and yet no one knew. And it became my chief purpose to put a story to this, to, to make sure that I could build something, build a brand, and to utilize the market, now this is interesting for a social justice student, to use the market to mete out justice. To build a company that's so attractive and so good at what it does, that it simply grows, and in growing, defeats the odds, defeats the people who are stealing, right? And so it was a lot of hard work. You could have taken a sort of legal route, but that would have, I didn't have the finances for it, and it also just didn't have the right energy, right? Am I gonna spend my time and money running after people? No. So we decided to build something, and this was, this was the goal. And We've gone now from having just had an intention and a vision to becoming an international brand, to being featured in art books, which never happened before, to being put in museums. And as, a, as an advisor to FedEx through the grant, I've, I've also engaged in conversation on the Entrepreneur Advisory Board with other entrepreneurs who are visionary in helping FedEx imagine small business and the role that it plays in society. So post-recession now, Sartonk is, is being seen as a business who has something to say about what business can do. So really, one of the other premises, I, you know, I have a lot of really important premises that, that sort of um, that animate the way that I think. I don't think any of us are here coincidentally, right? As a magician, I always thought about coincidence and luck as words that we use to describe things we simply don't understand. Now, I'm not saying everything is magical, but certainly there's a sort of mystery to life in who we meet, when we meet them, just like Don, that sort of really, really makes one wonder, are we on some kind of a path? And my premise is this. We are all precisely the right kind of us, right? Everyone sitting in this room, me, when I founded a business in 2009, um, when you walk out tomorrow, whatever challenge comes to us, we are the right person to deal with that challenge. And everything we have in our toolkit is precisely what we need to overcome and to make a choice. The question is whether or not we make the choice to confront and to engage or whether we choose to just not do that for whatever reason. Sometimes you, you make those choices to be there for somebody, sometimes, but nonetheless, if you look at the trajectory of your life, I really believe you'll see that everything you have, you need, and everything you gain from any kind of an experience is valuable to get you where you wanna go. That brings me to another point, which is that 
confronting reality is often kinder than living with the anxiety in your mind about what awaits. That is to say that being present, stepping into a moment, is often not as terrible as you imagine it to be. See, once we built the business and once we started branding, and we can talk more about this, branding from the ashes of adversity and telling a story about the, quote, originator of the modern boxing belt, that was a tagline that we came up with, and that was the, the, the goal. That was the first thing that I did was create a logo and a tagline. And that tagline caught on. It told the story. Once we started doing that, all kinds of opportunities emerged. Our backgrounds, my background in philosophy, my background in magic and social justice gave me the right tools to connect with people across business conversations that weren't always just about bottom line and product. It's about, business is about character. It's about who you are and what you bring to the table. Often that's what's going to close your deal. That's what's going to get you through the door. So I came to, to this world of business with magic in my arsenal, in my toolkit. And that told me to not accept impossibility to not take assumptions that would tell me that I couldn't do something. And when I came to boxing, I discovered a different metaphor, an incredible metaphor for life. The reason why the boxing movies are so rich and why Rocky resonates with so many of us is that it speaks to the part of our character that's ready to go. Everybody who's been on this stage, and I'm sure everybody in this room right now, has that character in them and has, has harnessed it. Uh, but everyone has that, right? And so boxing is this precise metaphor for life. Every round is a struggle. How you do in that round determines how you'll do in the fight. Each round, you have, to, you have to do something, right? When you get the champion, Jack Dempsey says, and this is a good quote that sort of makes the point. The champion, the champion is the person who gets up when he or she can't, to dig deep. And so if magic tells us how to think about impossibility, I think boxing tells us what to do with it. When I think about some of the important lessons that I've gleaned from, from running this company, um, I, I just want to move forward here for a second. I think about, that's what we just talked about, magic is not tricks as a way as something by Tenkai, he's a magician, and then the MC quote below. When I think about why Sartonk has been successful, why it's worked, I really have to keep coming back to purity of intention. What I've found is that if you have an intention, it should be pure at heart. You should do it because it's authentically something that resonates with who you are and what you want to do. And you should also not be afraid to go. You should not be afraid to leave and engage the experiences that await. Another set of insights comes from Father Daniel Berrigan, who's a Jesuit priest who just passed away. He was also a personal friend, and in my life, a twin elder to my own grandfather. Dan Berrigan died at 94. My grandfather is still alive. Dan Berrigan was a, an incredible Catholic activist. He was very famous for resisting the war in Vietnam by burning draft cards with homemade napalm, among other things. Dan Berrigan had a few things that he said all the time. One is, know where you stand and stand there. The other is, do right for right's sake. Sartonk is a story about doing something for the right reason. We didn't come into business. I didn't found a company to make a lot of money. I founded a company because I had to do something to stand up for the dignity of my grandfather. What emerged is an opportunity to leverage what I had at the time to create a company that sort of would resonate with other people. And our, our message now is honor your champion. And honor your champion is really just a way of saying, honor the people in your life who inspire you, who are in your corner. Everyone on this stage has had those people. Some of us have alluded to it. Everyone in life has them. They could be mentors. They could be teachers. By honoring other people, just like for me, I've honored my grandfather, it gave me an opportunity to see beyond myself and to, to step away from being the center of attention and to focus on the good that's come from other people. In our culture, that's almost countercultural. But I think by doing that, we're sending ripples out um, to, to really change the way people think. Now, in terms of insights, and I think where we want to go, I really think that there's something I, I decide formulized as the kind of axis of stillness. And I just want to bring this out now because it's resonated and it's sort of synchronous with a lot of what's been said. You know, we often think about not being stuck in the past, not being stuck in the future, not thinking too much about the future. There's also another axis, right? There's excitement at the top and infatuation and being psyched and there's sadness and depression at the bottom and being tired. The idea is to be at the center of it at all times. And for me, that's a really valuable part of my own uh, journey has been meditation or some kind of a, a habit, right? 
some, some kind of thing that we do to center ourselves, precisely when we get scattered. At various junctures in the course of this business, um, we've hit odds that were really hard to, to deal with. And I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to try to close with something um, very important to me now. I want to make one final point before I do that, though. As we're still in the present moment, we have to keep in mind that life is not just a linear line, but it's a dynamic linear line. So to use another example, if you want to write a book, right, and you, pub you send out a book and it doesn't get published, you get a response and it's, it's a negative one or it's no response at all, that shouldn't necessarily deter one because trying again is not just doing the same thing over again, it's doing something completely new. See, as life goes linearly this way, all kinds of circumstances are happening dynamically this way. You might have gotten rejected because the, the editor is going through a divorce. You might have gotten rejected because it wasn't the right time in society for that book. Trying again later um, is a completely new thing. It's a completely new activity. And it's important to keep being persistent in that way. That's what I've learned through running a business. And finally, I want to close with this. Being involved in medicine and the treatment of my grandfather for the last three months um, since he fell ill has been a really, really important part of my life. Being present to him has been challenging. It's caused me to not just run a business, but to also sort of seem to manage a micro business with his medical care. And one of the hardest things that I had to confront was that people who are over 80, the elderly in, in hospitals, are often thought of as eventualities, dying eventualities. And I've seen a lot of people neglected in this process. And I remember hearing for the first time a doctor saying to me that, well, you know, don't be unrealistic. Um, he's at the end of his life. It's been three months since then. And it's really important to wonder why people think the way that they think. They don't know our family members. And if we give them love and if we do things for the right intentions, if we maintain our axis of stillness, if we keep giving it a shot, and we keep doing the right thing for the right reason, we see great results. Just when I was leaving, the, well, the day before I left, because he was doing not so well yesterday, one of the nurses came up and said, you know, he's really doing incredibly well. He's healing very quickly. Every now and again, there's one that really astonishing, astonishes you, and he's the one. Really thought about this. I really thought about this, the, the way that we've, the family has treated him and his illness, and I thought, one thing that came to me is every single one of us is a one. Nothing is a certainty. Nothing is just an eventuality. What we do, the choices that we make, and the actions that we take, and how we leverage who we are is what really determines the outcome of, of what's going to happen. My grandfather's not just getting better because he's getting better alone, although he's a strong person. He's getting better because the family never succumbed to negative assumptions about his health. No matter what was going on, we sort of stood by him and, and were present to him saying that, you know, he's lived a great life, and if he wants to get better, we're here for him. And if he doesn't, then, then we're here for him in any case. So I really, I want to leave you with the message that every one of us is a one, that in fact there are no coincidences, and everything that we have and every experience that we walk into has the secrets to what we're going to need in the future. It's worked for Sartonk. Um, we're doing very well, and we're here with other people on this stage now that, that are doing incredible things in their lives. It's been incredibly inspiring to be here with you. I thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'm very much open to them. Thank you.